you can see on our screen, we do have Hugh and Mark with us here today. And as soon as we start slowing down in numbers, um, I'm actually just gonna go ahead and hand it over to them so they can take over. You can also see them live. So if you're interested in, you have any questions or anything like that, they will be joining us at the summit in March in Jekyll Island. All right, Hugh and Mark, I believe that we are good to go. It's all you. All right. Thanks, Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Skylar. My name is uh, Mark Rosenthal. I'm actually more of a Kata geek than a, J than a, a TWI geek, but I certainly dabble in that arena. And uh, I've been uh, been playing with, uh, not playing with, that's a bad word. I've been was introduced to TWI formally back around 2002 uh, when I was working at Kodak, and uh, ever since then I've always found it intriguing and I've been learning about it. And uh, hopefully we've got some stuff to share with you today. And Hugh is uh, my co-host. Thanks, Mark. Um, Go ahead, Hugh. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be with you. Um, my background's in industrial engineering and have run a number of different plants uh, like Mark and uh, done consulting work and many more. Uh, I got first exposed to TWI in the about the same time as Mark, but it was very tangential at that point. And it wasn't until 2008 when I was running a plant and had to deal with learning uh, how to get my supervisors and uh, the team management uh, up to speed to the skills they needed that I stumbled on this uh, and spent a lot of time with it. Uh, I've now taught about a thousand people uh, the various uh, elements of training within industry. Um, Thinking about it, uh, you can see in, in my screen, I wrote a book called Becoming the Supervisor that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, I've got uh, another one that Mark's been helping me with uh, that will come out later this year, uh, exploring how do you sort of a field guide for uh, uh, training within industry. And we're really happy today to um, share with you some of our thinking. And that new book is coming out in the memory jogger format, correct? That's right. Okay, so it's in the little little pocket guide that uh, if you have a, a fat pocket, you can carry it around in. And yeah, I've been uh, helping uh, Hugh edit that, and it's going to be a really good guideline for especially for somebody who's just trying to figure it out on the shop floor. So everybody should look forward to seeing that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and this and really what we're here to talk about today is some of the nuances of job relations and perhaps some of the stuff that uh, we've learned since the material was created in 1944 um, and um, and I just kind of want to do is just tee up a little bit of the underlying concepts and then what our plan is is to essentially together walk through the the JI card the 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 steps of job and job 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 relations the jr card and just talk about how it is that as you're going through this process um you can leave a wake behind you that is better for having a cohesive team versus one which might uh might not get exactly what you want in the long term so before we get into that um, hello, there we go. One of the challenges we're going to be talking, a, I'm going to talk a little bit about psychology. Of course, this, this comes with the standard caveat that this is an industrial engineer talking about neuroscience. So you have to take that with what, for what that's worth. But the other challenge that we have is we're talking about what's going on between our ears and the human brain is the most complex thing in the universe that we are aware of. Um, so we know a whole lot about how people think, but we don't know very much. 
and the links between what's going on in the hardware and what we call consciousness or maybe something we never understand. And there's a lot of psychological principles out there that have not stood the test of time. Some of them turned out to be poorly grounded in questionable research. Some of them have turned out to just be wrong. And, you know, as time goes by, that may well include everything I'm about to say. Um, but that being said, I want to go into what I think is the, <clears throat> the best body of theory out there today. And this is what's anchoring the conversation today. That's kind of why I want to go through it. And you feel free to chime in if something inspires you. So according to one cool theory, which is kind of cited down at the bottom by Decky and Ryan called self-determination theory, human beings have three fundamental needs that have to be that we have to we're going to be driven to meet in some way and if those needs are not met we're not going to be in good mental health one of them is autonomy where and i say autonomy we don't mean hey i can do whatever i want but it does mean that what i am deciding to do i make decisions on my own volition because what i am about to do is congruent with my values it's congruent with I, what i think is important so it's the opposite of doing something because i am being uh, uh, being coerced or i feel like i am complying with some kind of instruction uh, the other the, the second one is a sense of competence where I believe that I can deal with the challenges that are facing me right now is I'm not lost and have no idea what I should be doing. And the third is a sense of relatedness where I believe that the people that are around me care about my success and that I care about theirs and I am part of a social network of some kind. And these three things together are in their model what makes up good mentally healthy human being. So as we're thinking about these things in our organizations, we can look at how well does the work environment actually support these needs um, in the people, in the team, even with ourselves. We can start to ask those kinds of questions about how confident is your team that they can handle something, especially something that's unexpected or something that's non-routine. Do they feel confident in the support they get? Do they feel confident in how competent they are? Um, and then really start to segue into what we're talking about today. What are the overt things that happen in your work environment that either build or diminish people's sense of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And there's ways that we can talk to each other, even with the same message, that will either build these things or diminish these things in people. So digging down another level, one of the things that I think uh, makes up a, that support having a strong team and in turn that sets the stage for leadership is that people have trust in the organization and the people around them. They're willing to incorporate information from others trustingly into their own story, their own sense of what's happening with them. They are honest with others and, and are feel safe being honest with others so that others can incorporate their observations and their feelings into their story. So now we start to build this mutual sense of the truth. And there's a self-respect where I am willing to incorporate my own, my own story, my own feelings into what I'm hearing from others rather than disregarding myself. So these are just some of the things that we kind of want to have in the background. And as you're gauging in the job relations process, the question to ask is, are you contributing to building these things in the organization or not? In other words, how can your actions support or diminish these basic needs? Are you building teamwork or are you creating resentment? Are you in building full engagement or are you creating people who are being engaged in unwilling compliance based on some kind of threat? So um, the reason that I thought this would be a good topic is that the attitude that I have as I go into the job relations process 
has a huge impact on the wake I leave behind. And so that's kind of what I wanted to really talk to Hugh about was, you know, Hugh, you know, let each worker know how he or she is doing. Figure out what you expect, what you expect, point out ways to improve. So what have you seen that are some ways to do this, do this in a way that is potentially destructive versus doing it in a way that actually helps build people up? Well, you can just imagine, Mark, if if you are a supervisor and you're, I, you've observed a person working for you who's doing something incorrectly, whatever it is, filling in a form or uh, working on a computer uh, program or assembling parts wrong, how you point out uh, how they could improve uh, will make a huge difference in how people leave the interaction feeling. If I go in and just say, you know, use swear words and you've done it wrong, you imbecile, you know, you blah, blah, blah. Now you've got somebody who's walking away, you've torn apart their sense of competence um, and, uh, and, and you've just really diminished their sense of place. Um, whereas if you go in with a, a sense of curiosity and hmm, I, I see you've done this, uh, put those parts together that way, tell me what what was going on uh and now we can explore together what that is um but one is hugely supportive of the person and and the other uh just tears them apart and yeah uh, you know we we in in the uh, in, uh, um it, in the Kata school we actually were running a session where people were practicing on teaching their their child how to tie the, her shoes. And you want to think about that. You're doing it wrong is not going to encourage that little girl to try again. Uh, and I think that's a that's a, actually an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Um, so the next one is really interesting to me. Um, get this. There we go. So give credit when credit was due. And this comes, you know, some of this dates back to the 1940s, look for unusual or extra performance. And, you know, I one time uh, listened to a supervisor at a large company I was working at really resented saying thank you to people for just doing their job. But I think that's really important. I, I'm absolutely so with not, you on that, Mark, because I've heard the same thing, you know, well, that's what we pay them for is the is the the reaction why should i say thank you that's the exchange right it's commercial exchange but it's much more mm -hmm. than a personal ex or a commercial exchange i mean that's not who we are when we go to work it's not simply a commercial transaction it is a there's a personal involvement because we bring our whole selves there and so uh you know it the, the whole concept of presenteeism, you know, that the employee who's, yeah, they're physically there, but they're, they've checked out. Um, the fact that somebody's there yes, and willing right. to engage their energy to help solve the, the, the organization's problems, provide that service, that's worth saying thank you to. Um, that's worth saying thank you to. And you brought up a good point because so many of our HR systems and paradigms are based on a, a model of transaction. You know, that goes back to what I think is a toxic, a, a fair day's work, pay for a fair day's work. And immediately we set up that there is a transaction involved there and that that has a possibility of just tearing down the idea of everybody contributing. Yeah. Uh, to bringing their best, but I also have to support people. Um, the next one is also really interesting because, uh, uh, you know, changes that will affect them. But, you know, what about changes that don't affect them? That, that are just kind of tangential to where they are. They, they hear about it or yeah. see it in another part of the plant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because um, people and, will yeah. make up stuff, right? If they don't know what's going on, 
They will make it up. They will tell they will a story. Make up stuff. So if something is going to be happening and you know about it, let people know ahead of time. If if they're just going to see it or even just hear about it in the lunchroom, uh, yeah. there are very very few secrets. Um, yeah. And people people are amazing amazingly sensitive to things that change the routine around them. Yeah. And for uh, sure. And so, you know, the keeping thing, people informed about what's going on. Yeah, go ahead. The other thing I wanted to 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 key in on this, Mark, is the that second piece of work with them to accept change. And and in this case, although they wrote it 80 years ago, I think they're actually much more on the mark because you'll hear lots of people talk about quote unquote change management. And I don't know that we can manage change. You know, I can't do anything uh, directly to make Mark feel a particular way about a change. Um, but what I can do as a supervisor is walk beside them as they go through the emotional turmoil of mm -hmm. coming to grips with the change that's around them. I mean, the change very often the change is going to happen. You know, if, the, if you know new product coming in, the jobs are are going to change. It's not a choice. So, but we can't make them like it. All we can do is be with them as people come to uh, live with it. Um, and that's and where listening is so important. So important. And uh, if we come I back can't to tell your... people how to feel, but I, yeah, I can be curious about how they feel. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if they need resources or tools that would help them adjust more easily, then we can be attentive to that. Um, but at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to have to do that. And this one really, really drives that whole competence thing to me. Uh, yep. In that, uh, and, and, and Hugh was telling me when we were getting ready for this about some stories of people who were immensely overqualified in some ways. And, and I know I worked with a material handler who actually was a degreed engineer from his home country. Yeah. Uh, in in and, my uh, case, I had a, uh, once a guy that. doing, yeah. sorry, I had a guy doing packaging who had run the entire supply chain for a large international company in his own country. This was a total underuse of his capabilities. But I also had a guy who had run the maintenance for a squadron of fighters in Korea who was doing a simple assembly job. And I knew what he could do and invited him. And he said, no, right now I've got home stuff going on. I'm still learning English. I don't want to do it. Okay. But, but at least, that's, that's important. Yeah. At least we that, had yeah. recognized the skills. And then, you know, people must be treated as individuals is... You know, one of the so we're, you know, really what we're going through, and I forgot to mention this. These are what are called the foundations for good relations. The foundations for really building a cohesive team or or maintaining one as a as a as a supervisor. And this idea that people must be treated as individuals rather than stereotyping them or or you guys or the whole you know the whole concept of uh, of uh, everybody's. Uh, um, you know, one uh, one homogeneous cluster of people, um, and I don't know this is a part of the card that people tend to kind of bleep. People tend to bleep over this side, which is why we started with this side first. Yeah. The other thing about this, Mark, is that there's a there's a a great concern in many organizations that we need to provide consistency, and so there's a reluctance to treat people as individuals because they say, well, what if I make this decision about Mark and this other decision about Hugh and this other decision about Gina and whatever? And, um, and I think that 
misunderstands the situation because at the end of the day, each of us comes in with our own unique background and skills and you know our family situations are different our education is different our work experiences uh, whatever trauma we've experienced in our lives we're all bringing that with us and so um, we need to as supervisors as managers be aware of that and then i think that the way we deal with the consistency concern is on the other side of the card in terms of how we process situations um, and that allows us to take into account the the different facts of the individual while providing some consistency of pat a, a consistent pattern of of response on the part of the manager so we can move on to that side of the card here Let's do and that. this one is yeah this side is really a four-step process and it says you know how to handle a problem but really if you look at it it is it is a pdca cycle it is a process of learning about what's going on and actually running an experiment to to check whether or not the action you took had the effect you wanted and i just want to kind of you know go on a little bit of a tangent this this is taught as though you go through at one time but in reality, that question at the bottom, did you accomplish your objective? If there is a no, then you go back to the top and say, okay, what is it that I didn't understand and get some more facts? Um, is that so very I just least to advertise that? Yeah, because at very least you've done one thing to try an outcome, try and get an outcome, and it didn't mm -hmm. play out as you expected. So you've at least learned that. Yeah, uh, you've yeah, that trick never works. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to talk about this determine the objective yeah. thing a little bit because this is critical. Yeah, and, and I come at it because I say the supervisors, anyone in a managerial role really has two responsibilities. One is to look after the mission or achieve the mission of the organization. And the other is to look after your people. And the, that look after your people is, you know, comes back to that whole question of uh, the triangles that Mark showed on the first couple of slides. Um, and it, it, what I find is if you actually encourage people to say, okay, what is your objective in this situation from the perspective of the organization's mission? And what's your objective in terms of the individual and how you're going to support that individual? Um, and it, that's and really that's critical. really helpful. Because here's where I can poison the entire process. Because if my objective is to get back at somebody, to make them feel wrong, to inject fear, well, I'll, I'll make sure you never do this again, um, then I'm going to end up with that, at best, that unwilling compliance aspect. And I'm going to have to end up constructing such a complicated rule set to try to box people in that it becomes unmanageable. Yeah. Um, and, and so that determined objective has to include, how do I want this person feeling at the end of this process and making sure that I am engaging in that on purpose rather than from an emotional reflex of some kind you yeah. this guy made me really mad and i'm going to get him and I, i'd like um, to sort of riff on that a bit mark because how do you want that person to feel is not to say that you necessarily need the person to like you or to like the mm -hmm. the direction you're going but what you don't want to do is leave them feeling that they're powerless. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't want them singled out. Singled out. Um, you want that supervisory relationship strengthened so that the mm -hmm. person's going to do what's needed with some degree of willingness rather than under yep. being forced. 
and we'll get into that as we, we dig into we this. Yeah, so getting the facts is the part everybody skips. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think there are some really interesting things here, uh, especially when we talk about rules. Yeah, okay, there's rules and customs. And what I think of customs, what I'm thinking of is what, you, what, what, what everybody does every day. And, and the example that I have in my mind is if it's normal for your fork truck drivers to be, be in a hurry. Uh, and that's what they all do to the point where the whole organization rewards being on time more often or, or punishes being late um, uh, with something and rewards, you know, you know, promptness and only deals with it as an issue when there's an accident or a near miss. Well, you were driving too fast has to be taken off the table because the guy wasn't driving any faster than anybody else. And it's an organizational problem, not an individual problem. And so this is a case where I think as I research and really look at was the behavior that I'm really questioning is that what everybody does every day and just had a consequence this time? Or was this truly anomalous within the norms of the organization? Yep. Yeah. Another one that people run into all the time is um, so when the bell goes, if you're in a, in a situation where there's a break and a defined bell that lets you go back, is that at, mm -hmm. at the bell? Are you back at your workstation with the machine running? Mm -hmm. Or are you, is the, is the bell the indicator that now you get up from your chair and walk back to the machine? And, and, and that, there's not a right or wrong. To, yeah, there's not a right or wrong, but what does everybody do? Exactly. And, you know, the next bullet, you know, it says talk with individuals concerned and I would love to strike that out and say listen to individuals concerned. Yeah, because uh, all you need to do it, Go ahead. Yeah. So one of the techniques I could use is I could I could I oh if they're not willing to talk or something, I could I want to get them talking. That's my point. What do I have to say to get them talking? Hey, it seems like you're under a lot of stress right now. And then just like shut up and see if they correct me or see if they fill in some more information. That's a technique that I could use to do that. Yeah. Um, cause all you need to do to understand how much this could it support or diminish someone's sense of who they are is just think about amongst your friends, people that you know, what does the phrase talk to your father mean? Because that'll Ooh, have a whole yeah. lot of different meanings for a lot of different people. A lot um, of some different of that, people. Hmm? Yeah, Sorry, so I'm going to kind of move us along here. Yeah, um, that's okay. Um, and yeah, that, having the whole story, I got to be able to put together an arc that describes what is going on. Because at the end of the day, that's my whole idea here, which kind of leads us into that whole fit the facts together thing. Um, and so I know you had something to say about that second one, consider their bearings. Yeah, um, this is a, a, a key point on this card that you know, it was written in the 40s. Uh, and I have yet to hear anybody give me a clear uh description of what 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 we're trying to do there um, and where i've landed is that i want to be able to tell a, a coherent complete story that accounts for the facts that all go together the opposing facts and accounts for the gaps in what we know and i want to do that in 50 to 75 words so three or four sentences so, which is not an easy thing to do, um, but when you think about this in that way, you need to capture not only the events and the, the sort of performance issues, but what are, what are the individual circumstances and what is, how is the group responding to that? 
And so I, and, I just and, find that helpful. It's not right on target for our talk, but it's such an important thing. And if you've gone into this with a predetermined action you're going to take, you are jumping to conclusions. You are indeed. If you have gone into this to try to justify the action you've already decided to take, then go back to step one and, and, and really open yourself up to the possibility that you're wrong about what actually happened. In fact, if you have a hypothesis about what happened, go find evidence that says that's not it. And, and really and, try, to, try to really dig in and understand it. And I think that third point, uh, Mark, that what possible actions are there really plays on what you've just said. Because if you've gone in with sort of that predetermined action, you only have one possible action. And what I have noticed mm -hmm. is that until you get somebody thinking about more than about three or four possible actions, most of what they think, of, most of what people come up with is disciplinary stuff. Well, we could write them up. Oh, we're going to we're going to give them a, a statement of expectations. We're going to suspend the person for a day. We're going whatever it is. Um, so what I like to really do is encourage people to come up with six minimum and eights better of possible actions that and and what it forces the per, the practitioner to do is to be inventive and to explore some opportunities that might not have occurred to them otherwise. And that's very hard to get went in the early days, but as you get used to it, you, it, you can start getting very creative. And that comes to that last one, consider your objective and the effect. And that's really what we're talking about is what effect is. do you want to have? How do you want this person to talk about their day with their family at dinner? and or to talk to their talk about what happened to their coworkers because they're going to and that's really important because that in turn is going to set your reputation yeah and that's something to really consider that's yeah. the group and production that's right and and i just finish up on that the the thing that i ask people to do is to say does does the as you think about each action, does it strengthen or weaken the supervisory relationship with the individual? Does it strengthen or weaken the supervisory relationship with the group? And does it improve or worsen production? And it, if you ask those so I would questions, even say the re, yeah, the relatedness the sense of relatedness within the group, the sense of relatedness of this individual, does he feel more a part of the group or, or isolated from the group? And that comes back to, are you building stress in them or not? And, and that's really the key point here. Okay, moving on. Now I'm going to do something. Um, and, 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 and I think really this is, all right, if I decided what to do, uh, is this something that what I have authority to do and I'm capable of doing it? And do I have responsibility? Um, yeah. Like, is it my do person? Do I have responsibility? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, yeah, that's true. Is it my person? Uh, it may well be that well, I've discovered that the, that the action that's, that's required is actually in the domain of, of, uh, of some, of a peer or someone else, in which case the, the action I'm going to take is to what report what I've learned to someone else and then they, that part becomes their get the facts, one of the things that they consider. Yep. And then this is the part everybody skips. Uh, and we can do so much with this because, um, you know, following up is not just seeing, okay, uh, how's attendance changed? How's performance changed? It's also in my mind checking in. And if you have to even rebuilding trust and rebuilding a relationship that may have been strained a bit, 
uh, you know, one of the things in relationships in general in the study of them is, is not whether or not that, that, that defines a strong relationship. It's not whether or not there's conflict, but it's rather it is the, um, the, the effort to repair. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is crucial. What do I have to do to rebuild if there was damage, if there was tension? Yeah. And, and you see that in the third key point there, right? Watch for the changes in output. Yeah. Got to do the performance thing, mm -hmm. but attitudes and yep. relationships, mm -hmm. you know, have yep. you back to the, that question, have you strengthened or weakened those relationships? And it's really for thinking about it, going back to getting more facts. Because Often. I absolutely want to talk to, listen to people. I absolutely want to get opinions and feelings. So maybe a way to go about this is to go back to step one and review the record. How are we doing? Make sure that we haven't disrupted the new rules and customs in any way. Make sure everybody check in with people. It says talk to them, listen to them get opinions and feelings and reconstruct a new story. And if the story has changed, congratulations, if it's changed for the better. And then, okay, did it actually get what you were trying to accomplish? Did you accomplish what you intended to? And ideally, did you write down what you intended to accomplish before you began? Because if you didn't do that, I think you're just kind of riffing. Yeah, and, and that's what the job relations worksheet is all about. Right, that, that mm -hmm. it actually yeah, on, a, on a single page gives you a place to, okay, what is your objective? And that's right at the top of the page. And then, you know, yeah. your facts and the story and what the actions are. Um, but yeah, and, so, and when you yeah. look at that question of did you accomplish your objective, you're looking again at both of the both elements, the, the relationship with the individual did you grow that individual did you is that individual uh looked after better and are you getting the production the out performance outcome that you need and you need both okay so we're coming up on time we got a few minutes if there's open i don't see anything in the questions and i haven't been able to read the chat while my uh screen is being shared but uh you know, we just wanted to throw out an offer here. If you're wondering if JR is a good fit, get in touch. There's our contact information. Um, if you want to want to talk about this for you know an hour uh, to see if it's a good fit, uh, get a hold of you, get a hold of me, and uh, one or the other of us will be happy to uh, you know to dive into some of any of this with you for uh, for for a bit a bit of time. So I'm going to kind of kick it back to our host. Uh, was there anything lingering in the chat that I wasn't able to see? I don't see <laughs> anything in the, uh, in we the chat. We don't have anything um, as of now. We do have a couple of minutes if anybody wants to send in a couple yeah. of Q&A or chat. Um, and just real quick, I will remind you all that um, you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and it will come directly to your email address that you use to register for this webinar with. And I'm not seeing any questions. Um, we did get a chat. Can you can you both see the chat? Yeah, I can see that. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah I can now because I stopped sharing my screen. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see the question. What is the job relations worksheet? Uh, so this was uh, right from the start of the job relations program. They had a one page summary that was a place that a supervisor or whoever, you know, frontline leader could record the elements that they were working through as they used the card. Um, and if you want to uh, send me uh, a message, I'll, uh, I'll send you a, a copy of it and I'm happy to do that to anybody or or actually Skylar if we yeah. sent you Include one it. can you send it could you send yeah. it out to the to the participants absolutely I can do that that'd be cool then 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 everyone Perfect. will have it yep I can do that 
No problem. Anybody else? All right. So it was. I think that's. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, it Mark and Hugh, really for joining cool. us today. Yeah. Ahead, Thanks Mark. for spending your time yeah, with us. Thank you to all of you who have attended. I appreciate your your time and your listening. Yes. Yeah, so thank you, everybody who attended oh, today. Um, uh, oh, there a was question. Yep. In a question group just or to... <laughs> your, only yourself. Yes. If you know what you're doing, it would work as a group, but uh, it's intended as an in between a supervisor and an individual. That's the original intent. Yeah. And what you find is that for people who are learning it, if they have done their step one, getting the facts and uh, are working their way through step two, uh, it's often really helpful for beginners to actually ha talk somebody else through where their process. Yeah, um, have a coach, essentially. And, and essentially, you, you turn to your, your peer, uh, your colleague, as a coach, because mm -hmm. just explaining it to somebody else will uh, help you articulate it. And if your partner has the card in front of them, they can be looking to see, you know, well, wait a minute, I didn't hear that you had got anybody's opinions and feelings. So is that a whole? Uh, and so yeah, that can be really that's, helpful. That's perfect because yeah, yeah. Because have to if you have to explain your thinking to somebody else, you have to understand it a lot better. Yeah. And uh, Jane asked, do we have tips for developing skills? I can't think of a better way to do that than to go through the process and have to explain your thinking to somebody else and convince them that you have thought of everything. And, uh, and that also helps the other person develop good listening skills. And when you do that with your peer, um, whether you are the person listening or the person dealing with the situation, you're going to learn either way. And it's just yes. it's a matter of getting repetitions. Yeah, Rep repetitions with feedback. With feedback. That's the that's the tip for that's the tip for developing the skills. Yeah. All right. All right. So, thank you again to Mark and Hugh, and thank you to everybody who did participate. We will see you later. Bye bye. Thanks. Take care.